95% of the wealth in America is through small business, right? And so we're looking at extending those folks' legacy. You know, the way you take care of your customers is by taking care of your employees. And if you treat your employees well, the employees will treat your customers well, and it's a full circle. I'm Patrick Pacheco, and you're listening to Season 4 of In Good Companies from Cadence Bank, the podcast where we have your best interest at heart. Because at Cadence, we're much more than a provider of financial services. We're a lifetime advocate driven by your success. Before we dive into today's episode, we want to wish all of those who have served a happy Veterans Day. Thank you for your courage and for putting our country first. Now, turning to today's show, according to the national census, there are 16.2 million veterans in the U.S., with 4 million under the age of 55. Many come back from deployment with a whole life ahead of them and savings right for investment. But where does this new life begin? Our guests today have their ideas. I'm Rich Sexton. I uh, partner here at LDR Growth Partners and uh, been one of the first employees with LDR back in 2013. Will Bram, Connecticut native and one of the partners at LDR. Rich and Will are behind LDR Growth Partners, a private equity firm they have built from the ground up over the last decade. And it all started in the military. Rich is a former Airborne Ranger and an infantry officer. From deployment in Iraq to special operations in Latin America, he served overseas for seven years. But even in the early days, he had a penchant for business. And when he got back stateside, he did something about it. Rich went from serving our country to growing our economy through LDR. The road was winding, but it was a natural fit. So, first lesson today, it starts with grit. Here's Rich. LDR Growth Partners is a veteran-founded private equity group. We really kind of carved out a niche in the family-owned business. And we essentially started off with myself and two other veterans, J.D. Dolan and Lauren Gore, you know, did the the classical entrepreneurial thing that we essentially took $10,000 each and we threw it in a basket, also known as a bank account. (laughs) And we said our first project was going to be to write a book together. So we wrote a book on financial leadership for soldiers while you know JD was in deployment in Afghanistan Lauren was coming back on a deployment I was in South America and you know we were working on that book at 3 a.m 4 a.m I still remember drinking those five hour energy drinks trying to get through the chapters and we wrote that book in about six months and so that thirty thousand dollars that we started with was down to about four thousand after the book it was more philanthropic than anything else and so I decided that I was going to take the first leap of faith out in Casper Wyoming and we essentially worked with a midstream oil and gas trucking company. And we, you know, kind of really worked in a very, you know, hands-on approach with a close buddy of mine. But the long and the short of it was, is that we ended up bringing about $27 million of private equity money into Casper, Wyoming for this business. And that kind of put us on the map. We kind of like started off just, you know, really just trying to do good business with family owned companies. Two years later, Lauren Gore met Ryan Martin, who's our other business partner. And Will joined us full time in 2018. We came on um, kind of full bore with, you know, private equity and really looking at the industrial markets for American manufacturing. I think people don't ever realize how much sacrifice many successful business owners make at the, at the start. It's not just uh, it it falls in your feet. You really do have to make some sacrifice to get there. So early days, how did the business take off? What was what was the the nature of the kind of the first big deal? Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, I mean, to your point, when I decided this LDR thing, I I really, like I said, I had three thousand dollars in the bank account and I had this 1995 four cylinder Jeep Wrangler. So I basically packed everything I had, which wasn't much as a single soldier at 28 and I drove west to Casper, Wyoming. And uh, I worked out of the Jeep Wrangler for about a month, slept on a floor for about a month. I think <laughs> the reality was I remember sleeping on this floor because my buddy, uh, shout out to Miles Childers, would let me sleep in his house with two young kids. And I was sleeping next to his diaper pail. And the long or the short of it was I just told Miles he owned this trucking business and it was a family owned business. And I said, you know, Miles, like I really what I want to do here is I, I want to help you with this business, but I don't want to work for you as a W-2. I want to work as a 1099 with this company LDR and we, I want to see if I can provide value. And I said, hey, look, you know, pay me whatever you think I'm worth. I'm not trying to get rich here on this or engagement. I just want to provide value and learn. And I just worked free for the first three months, basically behind the scenes. 
helping clean up the, the stuff that we're doing today. Honestly, you know, there are small things. These small businesses are just so inundated with operations that they forget that you can go out and negotiate, you know, a gas discount policy for the company. Right. And so what I did was I let, aligned LDR with like success metric fees. Like every dollar I save you, I get 20 percent of it. So they paid us three thousand dollars a month in the beginning. And we basically got a, a percentage of savings of whatever we got on the company. And that's kind of where we proved ourselves to be valuable to them. And that's where we got a reputation in that small community in Casper, which is about 55,000 people, but very entrepreneurial. Spotting untapped opportunities. That's lesson number two on how to succeed. Look around you, find gaps in the market and put yourself on the map. We started getting additional clients and we realized that there's a lot of people out there that are really good operationally, but not necessarily has the business mind or discipline to focus in on some of these low hanging fruits that will exist on the back end of things. When we started doing that, that's when we started realizing there's more opportunity and you start to realize, oh my gosh, these guys in New York, they have a lot of money out there that they're trying to put to work. And you know, there's these companies out there that really need it, but they're not on the radar because they're in Casper, Wyoming. And so these New York guys, when I started talking about the kind of the bones of this business is doing 3 million in EBITDA, 20 million in revenue, you know, but they're bleeding cash. All of a sudden they get really excited about it because they're like, Hey, I got a lot of cash. What I don't have is a connection in Casper, Wyoming. And so when you can start, when you kind of create that bridge, all of a sudden it's like you become very important for the local populace and you become, you know, a trusted advisor for them because they see you as somebody who's kind of living and breathing their life. And you're not the guy from New York, but you're the bridge to New York. And so that, that was kind of the start. Life is full of financial decisions. We've got the products, services, and people to help make them easier. Stop by a branch or visit us online at cadencebank.com to find out why Cadence is the bank for you. Cadence Bank, member FDIC. LDR is about five minds coming together. One of them is Will Brain. When he joined in 2018, he brought on a new kind of expertise. I was actually, uh, I was an equity trader at JP Morgan and I was in that position for about 12 years. I think, you know, the trading floor and the energy there and it being like, you know, very much kind of like a locker room and high energy, all those things existed. And it was quite an eye-opening experience early on in my career. So I actually, you know, I ended up going out and getting my part-time MBA at Columbia Business School as well while I was still working at the bank. I had a, had a tremendous experience, you know, being in finance. And I think certainly as we've alluded to, some of those skill sets, um, very applicable to what we do day to day today. So you're a JP, everything's going well. How did your path cross with LDR? And then how did you decide it was time to leave JP Morgan? Because it's not always an easy thing to do. How did you make that decision? Yeah, yeah, Patrick, it's, it, you know, like it was a huge risk, right? Like I didn't really know Rich that well. And, you know, to answer your question, so JD was actually one of the first individuals I met at business school. So JD and I um, were in the same class at Columbia Business School. And, you know, he had the roots obviously back to Rich with the, with the touch points out to the trucking industry in Wyoming. And we shared like this very common interest in business ownership. And so we were chatting all the time and he was telling me about what they were doing at LDR. And so like we kind of early, early days had similar personal interests as well. So we graduated in 2015, so I went back to J.P. Morgan for a couple of years, and throughout that time, we were just we were chatting every single day. It was almost like you know all of us were kind of working two jobs. I'd work all day and then kind of like work all night at the same time. And I realized that I think coming out of business school I had a very very strong interest in business ownership and like really going the private equity route as opposed to being kind of in, in this trading position that I had been in for a very long time. So I ended up raising my hand at, at JP Morgan a month after my first child was born. And I think my wife was kind of looking at me sideways saying, you sure this is a big decision <laughs> right now? Um, you know, maybe six or 12 months from now, it might be a little bit better when we're a little more stable, but it was definitely the right decision. You know, I'm doing something that I'm really, really passionate about. And yeah, it was a huge risk walking out the door, as you said, Patrick. But I think the foundation for us was we recognized that like we, we had something special in the people and that that would lead to, you know, a successful outcome. Banking on people, that's lesson number three. And that also means keeping good people in good companies. Will knows a little about that. When he joined LDR, the firm acquired his dad's business, Whitman Controls. So carrying the company's legacy, that became personal. I was 
at business school and I was talking to one of my professors and I was like, Hey, I think I'm really interested in business ownership. Like, do you know any firms that like, you know, any brokers, like, how do you kind of like get in the mix? And like, you know, how do I start looking at companies? And we started chatting and I was like, Oh yeah, by the way, my dad has a company up in Bristol, Connecticut, which um, is a manufacturer of pressure vacuum, liquid level and and temperature switches serving a number of OEM and, and other B2B customers. But he was like, wait, 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 what? He was like, your dad has a company up in Bristol and you haven't really thought about like talking to him about buying that company. And it was kind of like an aha moment where like for me, it was really, really rewarding. I actually made the initial acquisition with uh, my brother Ramsey. And then subsequently, my brother rotated out and um, the LDR team came in. So, you know, obviously one of the things we talk about all the time at LDR is like continuing the legacy of the owner. And um, I think that was something that like really resonated for us at at an early stage, particularly with Whitman, was that like, it was personally rewarding for us to be able to do that. And I like to think personally rewarding for my father to know that like his legacy was continued with kind of like a trusted buyer. And then, you know, it was really like a milestone event for us to have an opportunity to acquire my family's business, you know, turn from really kind of like outside consultants to more like operators, owners and operators, and like see it firsthand that like really set a strong foundation for where we are today. So it's been a successful transaction and my father stops by from time to time and and pops in and makes sure, uh, you know, we're doing things the right way. And it's been great. Taking care of people starts with your own team. Every partner needs to be in the right place to use their knowledge and experience. Let a good piece of gear be all that it can be. I spent a lot of time in finance. So looking at our team holistically, that's really kind of like the expertise I'll say that I bring to the team. So with a lot of our businesses, they aren't quite large enough to support like a full C-suite. So you won't have a CFO, CEO, COO type roles. And so I really play like the backseat CFO um, with a lot of our businesses, helping them kind of with capital allocation and those types of things. But then as like you look to our broader team, I know we've mentioned them at a high level, but J.D. Dolan, Ryan Martin, and Lauren Gore. You know, Ryan Martin is a former Vincent and Elkins attorney, went to Harvard Law School, spends a lot of time on legal and governance. So he really plays like that, you know, legal compliance officer behind the scenes. He's also very sharp with sales and marketing. So we have him kind of step into that position. And Lauren Gore, also a, um, you know, Harvard Law grad, spent a number of years at Baker Botts, actually in industry. And so helps also on the legal side, but then also on the business development front. So very different backgrounds. And I think that's been a great competitive advantage for us looking at our individual businesses, because we have like this whole back support team that can really support the managers on the ground. So Rich, I'll have you explain a little bit more about your specific role. Yeah, no, I, I feel like I have the uh, the fun job, Will. Everybody's job has different challenges, but I always like really appreciate having guys like Ryan and Will side by side because, you know, you, you just can't do this work without good compliance and financial uh, diligence. And, you know, I always say that if you can't find an heir, Will Brain will find it. So he's a good guy to have on your team for sure. I get to focus a lot on working with the emerging general managers of our companies. So I do a lot of the on-site kind of one-on-one interactions with these business owners, which I really enjoy, but it's also interesting. I always say, you know, every company, whether big, small, has skeletons. And if you can't find the skeletons, you're probably missing them. It's just a matter of wrapping your head what they are and then being honest with each other because that makes a good partnership, a good working relationship and understanding what those potential risks are inside of those companies allows us to put our heads together. You know, a lot of my work is on site with the general managers and with the, uh, the operations team to make sure that we kind of implement the, the what we call the LDR way. Um, so it's a lot of fun. So you guys definitely have an interest in family owned businesses. It's kind of your expertise. What is it about the family owned business that, that excites you? There's probably like a, a myriad of, of ones, but the ones I can point to most specifically is that like, we're looking at extending those folks legacy. You know, you have 95% of the wealth in America is through small business, right? And so when you think about that number, these folks have been working in and out of small business for 30 plus years. And when they go to sell it, the last thing they want to do is have it chopped up and sold to somebody who doesn't have those touchy feely kind of uh, warm interactions. You know, how do we kind of extend that that legacy so that it's not being sold overseas or going into a more traditional financial group where we're really reinvesting in these companies, putting additional cash to allow them to grow, and then obviously providing the horsepower to to get the right leaders in place. So 
you know, we really try to put a lot of time and effort in making sure we hire the right people, the right cultural fits. But the way you take care of your customers is by taking care of your employees. And if you treat your employees well, the employees will treat your customers well, and it's a full circle. The LDR way is all about care. So take note, if you want to succeed, stay human, know your stuff, and take a genuine interest in the companies you work with. I think being genuine in this space is like really important. We were birthed into family-owned businesses. So I think when you come and talk to a family-owned operator, they kind of want to know that you understand those nuances. You understand like how nepotism works. You understand like the political landmines, although not a large bureaucracy still exists in these family-owned companies, right? And there's a, a million stories of that. But they want to understand that you you know that you can't go in there like a bull in a china shop. You can't be a corporate guy, quote unquote, to come in there and just start, you know, throwing in policies. And when you do change management, you really need to think about incremental change. It needs to be slowly over time. You know, I'm going up up north uh, next week to do a town hall is what we call it. And a lot of private equity groups don't do this. We're literally going up there to make an announcement to this family owned company, to their all their employees who they see as family. And we're walking them through the process of how we've done this numerous times. And that gives family members specifically a lot of comfort in the idea of handing over this company, which is figuratively speaking, their baby and them understanding that this is in the, the right person's hands over this next chapter of the business. And so it allows us to kind of stand out amongst our competition because a lot of people who play in this two to $5 million EBITDA space, they're not necessarily looking at this in the same sophisticated way that we are as a professional buyer. What we're seeing is like the opportunity to grow these companies, make them LDR companies, professionalize them, implement ERP, create systems, you know, have an org chart, have all those systems that the larger financial buyer would want and grow them to north of 5 million of EBITDA to kind of really put a stamp on, you know, where these companies are going to be able to scale and grow into the future. Buying a company, that's just the first step. Once you're in, the real work begins. The thing is, is that the dynamics with these family-owned businesses, that even if they don't, quote-unquote, have the echelons of president, CEO, they still have a power asymmetry with the employee base of being the boss. And what it does is it creates conflict between the incoming leadership and the outgoing leadership. And a lot of times what we find is that if you can create a transparent social like capital with that seller, that family owner member, what you can do is say, like, what do you want to do in your next chapter? Like a lot of these folks have been working for, you know, 50, 60 hours a week for the last 30 years. They don't necessarily want to go just go fishing for the next, you know, 30 years of their retirement. So they may be interested in the design engineering component, or they might be really interested in just the sales customer facing component, but they're not interested in running payroll or dealing with employee issues like that stuff. They're like, yeah, you can take all that. But like having that collaborative conversation with them allows us to put them in that consulting metric like Will was talking about, have them go on the board and be like, okay, this is your lane. You're not an employee, but you're focused on this. You have a ton of tribal knowledge here. We don't want to lose that. But at the same time, we don't want you to be an employee of the company because that's just setting everybody up for you know disaster. So you know, I think it's that conversation that we have up front that really kind of brings some resolve there. You acquired Mustang Motorcycle, Cincinnati Radiator, Ohio's Heat Transfer. Uh, one, kind of kind of a manufacturing sector. Two, you guys really have a focus on the United States and U.S.-centric business and who you sell to and who, who you're buying. What drives that and what brought that about, really? I mean, I think this is like our core investment thesis. So Will and I probably both have very similar opinions here. But, the, you know, the idea is that the pendulum swung really hard to outsourcing back in the last 30, 40 years. And, you know, I grew up in the Rust Belt to some degree and, and Lauren did as well. And what we saw was a lot of these manufacturing companies leaving the U.S. to take their business overseas. And, you know, honestly, the supply chains have been, you know, very thin in the last 10, 15 years. I think COVID really exasperated that. And it showed this example that if, you know, if China decides to shut their doors, we do not have supply lines internally that allows us to continue to produce and operate autonomously. So I think for us being veteran owned, you know, there's a lot of ways to show, dem show and demonstrate patriotism. And I think, you know, bringing light or short line manufacturing for critical needs inside of the U.S., Hey, there's a great, there's a good profit there, right? Because you're, you're able to provide a service that might take six to nine months if you were to go overseas in two weeks or less. But it also allows us to kind of really double down on what America is really known for still, which is quality. It kind of reads the core of, of kind of what LDR is. Investing in local companies also means supporting our communities. 
a lot of these companies, you know, they're not in, you know, downtown Houston or downtown Detroit. They're outside of fifth Philadelphia. They're outside of Boston, Massachusetts. They're in these rural areas that are starving for jobs. They're starving for positions. And it's really kind of like, in my opinion, the heartbeat of America in these blue collar districts that, you know, were kind of robbed of their employment statuses over the last 30, 40 years. And so it makes us, you know, feel good about what we're doing in the sense that we're, you know, really trying to double down and create jobs here in the United States. And so it gives us really great social relationships with local municipalities. But then most importantly, we're also, you know, kind of creating a return for our investors and ourselves and creating more opportunities for the employees to, to get paid as well. So that right there has to really set well with the companies you approach to purchase. I mean, that that is not the focus and has not been the focus. And that's what the, I think these companies probably even started thinking they didn't want to be outsourced didn't want to, they wanted to be a US based company a US US centric and I think that's got to resonate really strongly with them so let's jump a little bit down towards towards leadership i think it's fair to say that that the military leadership training inspired your business philosophy would, would you agree uh, rich yeah essentially inside the military you use ldr like a squad leader or a team leader or a platoon leader and you just abbreviate it with an ldr and then, you know, at the end of the day, the leaders kind of make or break any organization. So we thought it was very fitting for our organization that invests heavily inside of the leaders of these companies. But what's interesting is a lot of times with the military, the, the, they do a lot of things not so well, but a lot of things really well. And it's one of the longest standing traditional approach of, of organizational leadership. And so they have this thing called the rule of four. And so the rule of four essentially is that there's four brigades in a division, there's four battalions in a brigade. There's four companies in a battalion. There's four platoons in a company. The long or the short of it is, is the idea is that you should only have four people directly reporting to you. And if you do that correctly, that is really what has made the American military so dynamic because that is how you actually are able to scale these 100, 200,000 person militaries into geographic regions because they're, they have this coordinated approach with their leadership team. So everybody has a job. They have their left and right limit. They know what those limits are. On these smaller companies, you'll have a 30, 40, 50 person company, and it'll just be like all of them will report to two people. You'll have 20% of the, you know, the things that you shouldn't be dealing with taking up 80% of your time. So that's kind of where we, we really start. And that's why we have LDR leadership kind of help with some of that organizational design. You got to design your team first, and then you can kind of start putting people in blocks underneath it. And that allows everybody to kind of have a feedback loop of how they're doing and how they're performing. That's where you can do incentive programs and allow the team to, to function in a high performing way. Okay. So structure is the first thing, but there's gotta be a big human component. You know, people have been doing things a certain way for a long time. How do you get them past the idea of, well, this is just how we do it. Yeah. That's always like, you know, the, the most dreaded, but most commonly used term that you hear, this is how we've been doing it for the last 20, 30 years. And just because you've been doing it one way doesn't make it the right way. But change management is best in very, very small bites. And for what we do is, you know, I always say measure twice, cut once. And so really, you know, with that incoming leader, so we always are hiring typically a key leader to bring into these companies. We're putting them through a personality assessment, which is different than a behavioral assessment to see how it matches with the existing leadership. And so what you normally will find is that if you do a personality assessment of the current leadership of a company, you'll get some insight into the culture of that company as well. So if there's low trust on that leader of that company, you know there'll be some, probably some trust issues in the, in the company itself. And so you'll want somebody with high trust because they won't have 20, 30 years of social capital built up with that same group. And so like that's a way to mitigate it is those personality assessments. When you get to know a company, you have to be on the front lines. You have to dive deep, learn about their culture, and figure out with them what needs to change. There's these things called manager bias. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. It essentially, what it does is it gives about 25 to 30 diagnostic questions to the employee base. For example, my manager gives me feedback on a weekly basis, yes or no. The manager may say, oh, yeah, I give feedback every day. And then the employee will say, I haven't heard from my manager only once a year at the annual review. And that's a manager bias, right? Every company has this. There's no perfect score for this, this quote unquote test or diagnostic. But what it does is it gives you a guide map to how do you kind of lead into what I call the power symmetries, right? So even if you're the CFO, that doesn't necessarily mean you're the quote unquote leader of that company. A lot of times what you'll find is like, I always say, who manages the water cooler? When you go on lunch break, Who's the guy that or gal that people look to 
for confidence in certain decisions that are made internally. There's always those conversations. Oh, John's doing this. Why are they doing that? And Suzanne may say, this is why it's happening. And all of a sudden, even though Suzanne's not the quote unquote titled leader in the company, she is a large influencer of that company. Who are those influencers inside of your company that may be the executive secretary or they may be the machinist, it could be the welder um, that's been there for 30, 40 years. And those are the people that when you bring in decision-making, key decision-making, you bring them in as a collaboration tool and that makes them feel like they're part of the plan and you're no longer forcing the, wa- the horse to drink at the, at the river. Now, all of a sudden, he's bringing his people with him to drink the water. So, Will, occasionally end up having to bring in new leadership What's the recruitment process look like for new leadership? We spend a lot of time collaborating with the owners, the sellers of the business on on who the new transitional leadership is going to be. We run an interview process in collaboration with a staffing agency we've worked for a number of years, but the sellers of the company are heavily involved in that process. And so they have the best understanding of their culture of who would fit well in their facility, who would get along with their employees. And so that's really how we think about change management is making sure that the sellers of the business have a big hand in it and they're fully signed off on the person who's coming in. And, you know, in a couple of cases we've actually promoted within, which has worked really well also, right? Folks who have, you know, high integrity, who are highly passionate about the company, who have been there for a long period of time. At a high level, we really like to have that collaboration through the sale process to make sure that everyone sees like continuity and a a seamless transition on the backside. And when things go wrong, because things will go wrong, the only thing you can do is learn. Take it from Rich and Will. There's a saying in the military that no plan survives first contact. When you go through these plans, the execution gets a little messy as it always does. But then what's really important is after that happens, going through and doing sustain and improves, like have a conversation with the key stakeholders and figure out what did we do well? And let's make a deliberate conversation so we can ensure we do that next time. And then what did we maybe improve upon like for the next operation that we're going to be doing? And I think that's allowed us to do is really the 10,000 hour rule, you know, where you do 10,000 hours of something, you become an expert. Same thing we preach at our manufacturing companies. If you do that same task over and over again, every time you do it, you do it slightly better, slightly better, slightly better. That's kind of like your lean methodology that we're preaching at our manufacturing companies. We practice it inside. It's just a forcing mechanism to kind of look back at what did we do well and what would we improve upon next time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it wouldn't be private equity, honestly, if there weren't highs and lows. So for us, it starts with a lot of the things that, you know, Rich solely mentioned, right? Like Rich and, and that side of our team, they go in and they make baseball cards about every single employee at the business. Who are you? What kind of handshake deals might be in place? How many kids do you have? Where do you live? How long have you been at the company? And like little things like that go such a long way and develop trust over time. So I think that has mitigated some surprises that come on the backside. But but as you mentioned, there's always going to be surprises. I think it's for us making sure that like we have the right cross-functional team in place to tackle those surprises. You know, there's all these stories that we could go on talking about, like we've maybe it's not the right leader, there's not the right org chart in place. Or last year we had a tree go through the top one of our manufacturing facilities. And literally I have people building units around like branches of a tree, you know, like this is the stuff that like you just, you know, you kind of battle through every single day and you deal with the setbacks and um, you just make sure that like you have the foundation of the team in a position to tackle them. Collaboration. That's our final lesson. When we work together, we thrive. So once you're in business, take it step by step, observe, adapt, and get people involved. But most importantly, believe in your team because they've got your six. I always have friends tell me like, oh, I'm thinking about going to business with somebody. And I'm like, you know, look, I mean, five partners will sit here and tell you the same thing. We all have war stories internally, kind of like there's five more people you're married to. You know, you're just interacting with each other on every level. So the fact that the five partners are still together, I think we've already beaten the odds in that. And I still remember a couple of years ago talking with Will and saying, look, man, 20 years from now, if all five of the partners are still together, we've won. So, you know, I think the reality is, is like we're already beating the odds there. And so I think that's probably the thing that I'm most proud of. Yeah, no, I I would echo the same. I mean, when I first joined LDR, one of my friends said, you know, it sounds fantastic, except for the fact you have five partners. 
you know, just a quick plug, like just closed our first fund last week and closed on our first investment in that fund this week. And that's something that we've talked about for a number of years. And we never would have gotten there without the, the diverse skill sets of the team, but also like the diverse networks as well. You know, Rich is down in Houston with two of our other partners. I'm in, you know, Southern Connecticut, our other partner, JD's outside DC. And like, that's afforded a tremendous opportunity for helping build our, you know, our, our investor base and our partnership base. So really proud of the team. Um, really proud of, of where we are today. It was a thrill to speak with Rich and Will today. So if you're a veteran looking for your next venture or an entrepreneur moving into private equity, let's learn from LDR success. Building a new business takes time and determination. Invest your savings wisely and make connections with people outside your field of expertise. The more diversity on your team, the better. You have to be smart, too. To find your place in the market, ask yourself, what are we missing? Find your niche and focus on it. For LDR, that was industrial manufacturing and family-owned businesses, and it made them stand out. Finally, connecting with companies is the heart of what you do. So take a human approach. Learn how their business works on the inside. Understand their culture. And look at things from their vantage point. The more you know, the better place you are to drive a company forward. I'd like to thank Rich Sexton and Will Brain for sharing their story of grit and inspiring many others along the way. In Good Companies is a podcast from Cadence Bank, member FDIC, equal opportunity lender. Our production team is Sheena Cochran, Edie Pingeli, and Natalie Barron. Our executive producer is Danielle Cornell. This podcast is made in collaboration with the team at Lower Street, Writing and production from Andrew Gannam and Lise Lavati. Sound design and mixing by Ben Crannell. This podcast is provided as a free service to you and is for general informational purposes only. Cadence Bank and its affiliates make no representation or warranties as to the accuracy, completeness, or timeliness of the content in the podcast. The podcast is not intended to provide legal, accounting, or tax advice and should not be relied upon for such purposes. The views and opinions expressed by the host and guests in this podcast are solely their own current opinions regarding the subject matters discussed in the podcast and are based on their own perspectives. Such views, perspectives, and opinions do not reflect those of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates or the companies in which any guest is or may be affiliated. The production and presentation of this podcast by Cadence Bank does not imply the expression of any opinion on part of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates.